Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast brought to you by RaceForThePrize.com. Texas Trucks doing the early homework because we always do the early homework and this is the week to do the early homework. But before we do that homework, go to RaceForThePrize.com so you can do the homework. Get the spreadsheet, 20 bucks discounted for the rest of the month. All the sheets that you need, they're going to save you time. They're going to make it easy. You're going to have more fun. I want you to be a part of this. I want you to join us. And when you join us, you help me and you help my family. Texas Trucks, homework. So why is homework so important this week? Well, first of all, you're going to have a Friday qualifying. And then minutes later, the race happens. So you want to go in cold? Do your work now so that you can adjust on the fly. I mean, just put yourself up to a head-to-head against someone else who hasn't been working, someone that doesn't do videos, someone that doesn't do content, someone that didn't do any homework, someone that hasn't looked anything over. I would say more chances than not, you are going to beat that player and you have a better situation. That's why we do these videos. And so in this video, what is the most significant thing we need to talk about? Well, first of all, let's just talk about the themes of Texas and how Texas plays out and how that's going to help you construct a lineup. Is it chaotic or is it calm? It's not your everyday 1.5 mile, obviously, because they changed the banking. They had to repave the thing a couple years ago and to flare it up, they went the Kentucky route of having different banking and then lathering on the resin PJ1 over the years. It is not your typical 1.5 mile track. It is not your old Texas. Since about 2018, we've had a different situation. It is chaos. It is calm. Let's just look at the facts. It's a one groove track. And then you have a second really slick, dangerous groove. And when you have a second slick, dangerous groove, one would expect, well, this thing should be chaos all the time. But somehow it's not always chaos in the trucks and Xfinity series. But there is quite a bit of chaos. And now you should be thinking in your head, okay, Punt City, Value City, lineups are going to turn on a dime. I'm going to chase place differential. Those thoughts all should be entering your head right now and will be staying in your head all week. And then you want to be conscious of those while you're building during that short window on Friday. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this homework. You don't need to necessarily write it down, but you know chaos. You know place differential. You know value. But it's not always like that. More often than not, it is. And in theory, though, if these teams can survive a restart, now, it's not a white track. You know, I mentioned this in a previous podcast. Some people might say, well, it was the last intermediate track. Let's look at Las Vegas. Las Vegas is wide. There's many grooves. You can spread out, and you can run green a lot easier. This track's not going to widen out. And it may be tempting for some drivers to try to expand their racing lines and think that it's widening out, and then it doesn't, and then they're in the wall, and then we have a caution, and then we have the restart, and then we have a caution, and then we, okay, you get it, you got it. But there have been times when the restarts have gone well, which can get really tricky too. You're running side by side, and you're right on the edge of that dangerously slick groove that's just not there. It's a very high speed track. You're on the edge of, you know, loose, and you go to the wall. Edge of control, I would say. Either way, we have seen times where they do survive the restart, they do spread out, and they can run under green, and everybody just follows the rules, follows their line, and doesn't step out of line. But the smallest misstep at Texas, and you're into the wall. I think one of the perfect examples last year was Justin Allgaard, who was having an excellent Xfinity race, a small misstep, and he drops from the lead to 20th. You just cannot get out of your groove or you're done. You're toast. You're done. And, and one would believe that, okay, well, if that's the case, if leaders stepping out of line, leaders getting arrow loose, this thing should be absolute chaos. Wreck fest, and that's the way that I want to build. But it's just nothing is always. You would expect it to always happen. And Texas does tend to be on the more violent, crazy side, but it's not as absolutely out of this world as you would think. But then again, nothing is always. I mean, Daytona is not always Daytona. The best way to approach this week, I would not go into thinking Texas is an absolute wreck fest. It's hairy, but it's like an intermediate track with some Texas heat or some Southwest spice on it. And we can look 
I'll throw up the cautions because I wanted to go through it to make sure that I didn't completely, oh, this is a crazy nonstop breakfast. I mean, obviously, if you look at last year's, and that's going to influence a lot of people, and last year's Texas race was an absolute crazy breakfast. As you can see, your average dream flag lap was 11.3. And if you just look at stage three, I think we began stage three with the small little 12 lap run, but then you have a three lap, a six lap, a one lap, a one lap, a one lap. The leaders wreck at the end of the race, for heaven's sake. It was pretty brutal, and that may weigh heavily on the minds of many people. That may heavily influence people. And then, you know, you just rewind to last week in the truck race. They're wrecking each other nonstop again. And that was the theme earlier this year. Remember, Phoenix was a debacle to close the season. Daytona was a debacle. And everybody was up in arms. The media was going crazy. These kids, these idiot truckers, it's a really bad look. We need to do something about it. Then we had the Las Vegas race and everything was back kind of the normal. And everybody was polite. But again, as I mentioned before, Las Vegas can widen out. Las Vegas can have a lot of space. We still expect Las Vegas to be more crazy nonsense. But they got together. They ran green. And everybody was polite and things worked out. And for the most part, the season moved on and that chapter closed. Well, we revisited that chapter last week at Martinsville where, I mean, perfect example. I think you look at Stuart Friesen just dumping Timmy Hill or driving through him at the very end of, of last week's race when Stuart Friesen is doing it. I mean, it's not just the idiot kids. When one of the veterans of the sport who's actually running pretty well at the moment takes out his frustration on, of all people, Timmy Hill. Like, man, you might have picked the wrong guy to pick on. You know, Tiny Tim out there kicking his cane away, Scrooge McDuck style. Either way, are we back to Crazy Wreckfest? And if that's the case, rolling into Texas is not a good sign. We can look at the other races at Texas. So here we go again. May not seem like a lot. And you can see on the screen, stage one, it's split into two sections. Stage two, they run completely green, which is really only 29 laps. But then stage three, one, two, three, four cautions. Wave arounds, maybe you get lucky dogs, but... That's resetting the field. That's changing leaders. That's just asking for more problems. Average green flag run of 14.1, quarter of the race under caution. Not as spicy. You know, if we're doing our, our pepper, what are those called, man? Now I forgot how uh, the skulkum, skulkum, skolan levels, whatever. This is not the hottest heat. It's not a habanero. It's not a ghost pepper. Maybe this is ghost pepper. This is more like spicier than poblano, I suppose. Then we go back another year, 2021. Not crazy, but it. But the weird thing was, like, if you were to cut this race in half, you'd say, yeah, well, it's pretty crazy because the first half of the race featured, featured six cautions and a lot of short runs, and then all of a sudden some magic spell comes over and like, all right, we'll just run 70 green now all of a sudden, which is pretty impressive. If you looked at the first half, it's like, oh, here we go again. And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, let's just stop wrecking. Like I said, if they can run green and everybody just stays in their line, then you're going to be fine. But at the same time, and you just step out of that groove a little bit. Now, one of the changes is this is going to be a night race. So there should be added grip. But then again, that just attracts more speed and pushes car trucks a little bit faster you know you're when i think of texas night races though i remember back in the the teens and those things were wild and crazy 2019 2018 when they were running the night race more frequently in the spring i suppose it's the daytime where maybe the drivers are taking it a little bit easier here we go again 2020 plenty of cautions right there and you've got one two three four five six in stage three and that's going to take out mid-pack drivers back of the top pack drivers open the door for value um, change lead changes 
and you're obviously going to have drivers with average running positions that are that or whether well, finishing positions much better than average running position and when that's always the case then your practice data really wasn't the greatest because slower cars are going to finish better well they shouldn't have they didn't have any speed in practice yeah it didn't matter because we just keep hitting reset they weren't getting lapped they weren't losing a lap they were just hanging in there picking up some attrition spots maybe grabbing a good restart here or there and when it's all said and done, that car, that, or that truck really wasn't that fast, never really had to be. It just needed to survive, have a couple beneficial restarts. It was always just kind of in there in the pack because we kept hitting reset. Now, if you get a 2020 spring race, night race, long time ago, pretty green. So it can be fine in Texas. But then you rewind it again to 2019 in the fall. And we have an average green flag run of 7.4. We've got cautions everywhere. One, two, three, four, five in stage three. You go back to 2019 in the spring. 10 flag green flag run. We do get two decent green flag runs in stage three. But again, we had plenty in stage one. Overall, this race leans chaos. It's not a pure dumpster fire. It can turn into that as we saw last season. And it more often does set on fire. Now that was that blaze get out of control. Not always, but I expect plenty of fire at Texas. Plenty of chaos, plenty of craziness. If you want to bet on it being calm, that is fine by me, but I will build accordingly. Second question. And the reason why we're doing this early week homework and why we always do it again you're gonna have a short texas truck building window if you're just waiting on picks on friday night good luck maybe it'll work out for you but me and my crew we're gonna work early thanks for joining me like the video subscribe the video share them with other people recruit people bring them on over come get them on our team we're the workers we love this. We love racing. We love talking racing. We love thinking racing. We're driving in the car to work and we're thinking about racing. We're thinking about DFS. We're thinking about events. You're thinking about are the tires too wide in the Cup Series? What physically would happen if they made thinner tires? And although you're not a physicist, you do play one while listening to podcasts. You debate it in your mind because you love this stuff. That's why we talk racing and do video content early in the week. Here's the question you got to ask yourself, folks. Get off the tires. Kyle Busch. It's a Kyle Busch week. And he's going to be $1,600 at least. And you need to start having the conversation with yourself right now. What are you going to do? That's why we're here. You don't want to wait till Friday night to have to figure out, can I play Kyle Busch? You don't want to have to wait till Friday night to start doing the math and getting your abacus out. And you don't want to just rely on what some guy tells you what to do. You get to make the decision. You get to build your lineups. You get to differentiate and separate if you do the homework now, if you have the conversation now. What's it look like? What has it looked like? Are you going to have time to go through previous lineups on Friday night? Are you just going to have to trust somebody's going to tell you what to do? You want to be told what to do? That's not this jam. That's not what we do here. You do what you want. I'm going to give you information. I'm going to help you walk through it. And then you're going to make the decision. If you go the Bush 1600 route, which I'll tell you right now, I'm going Bush 1600. Obviously, it's during the week and we haven't seen anything. But what's going to change my mind? What is going to change your mind from playing Kyle Busch this week. Ask it. This is not rhetorical. Has he been fast this year? I mean, you can see on the screen, it's small sample size, but if we look at his driver rating in 2024, his average driver rating is third in the truck series. Measured against the field, that's the best. Spire trucks are fast. Spire trucks have been fast at this racetrack over the last several seasons, if not for its existence. Spire truck allied trucks have been fast. Now, I'm not sure how strong the relationship between Nick Sanchez and RevPro was last year, but I think there was something there. And we know that in 2021, it was a Spire truck that won the race with Chase Elliott, even though he started 20th. 
at a place where you can't necessarily pass. I know, by the way, if we just rewind it to the last time Kyle Busch was in Texas, he wins in the spring of 2020. He wins in the spring of 2019. What is going to change your mind? That he doesn't jump into a cold truck and lay down the fastest lap in practice? Not worried about it. That he doesn't go down there and qualify in the pool? Not worried about it. Yeah, but he's so expensive and he's got to score all these points. I just, you know, he really limits what I can do. And there's not a lot of green flag laps. And you're going to hear that. Oh, well, taking all these cautions and you do the math and you start calculating. Didn't stop him before. Did not stop him before. Has not stopped him in plenty of races. But, you know, you got all this craziness going on. Yeah, it's not that crazy on the pole. It's not that crazy up in the front. He's done it before. He'll do it again. He's not racing on Friday night for fun, folks. He's got better things to do with his life than to spend a Friday night in a truck. He's there because he wants to be there, because he wants to win. He is motivated. He's getting some cash. He's getting some trophies. He wants to look good in front of his son. He's there to win. He's going to score points. Yeah, but does it work? He will score points, and other guys won't score points because they can't score points. And although he may not score as many fast laps as you want, and although he may not score as many laps, lead points as you want, right? You've got this number in your head, what you need. Now, whether that's based on other intermediate tracks or whether that's based on Martinsville, I just don't know if he can score enough. Okay. Step back. Who could score more? The guy starting second, finishing second for $10,000, he's going to be a good point per dollar play? No. The guy starting fifth, who also finishes fourth, the drivers that are going to finish up front for the most part are going to start up front. They're going to cost a lot. And that means that they're not good point per dollar play either. And so although Bush doesn't maximize point, point per dollar play, he isn't like the most perfect DFS play. The raw points are there, and no one else hammers the scoreboard. And he works. And we have seen that play out before. And if we want to go the Kyle Bush route, which I am heavily leaning into, which again, nothing is for sure. And I will give you a scenario where we might have to change our mind a little bit. But we can just look at those races on your screen, the 20 spring race, where he was optimal. And then I get to tell you about something fun and unique that you don't always get here. We're not talking double punt. We're talking about the legendary. Once in a blue moon, or solar eclipse, triple punt. That's right, they do exist. They are out there. You want a $1,600 Kyle Busch, 17 fast laps, 18 laps led, which is pretty good, 84. You want him in your lap, and he even didn't even run away with the race because Christian Eckes, his teammate, had seven fast lap points and 13 laps led points, but you had a difference of 20 points between him, and then everyone else just kind of had good days. He only had a 5.3 FPBK, but he was still optimal because even though we kind of surprisingly had a very good day from Matt Kraft and a very good day from Stuart Friesen, both going over 6X, Christian X is over 8X, who actually helps us because he was very affordable. But no one really scores any points. Everybody's in this 40 range. But the triple punt of Austin Wayne Self in the 2022 Tim Self AMS Race car, Corey Roper, Kevin, Kevin Swinski is probably a part of that too as well, right? Race truck, Corey Roper in the Roper Mobile, and then Roba in the Roba Mobile. Obviously, names that we are familiar with in the truck series, playing DFS NASCAR over the years, but and you know Roba has improved, but 2020 Roba was definitely backpack he wasn't even the top of the backpack we're talking 25 ish Corey roper always around 25 ish now austin wayne self 
typically could on occasion get to 15th. It was a decently funded racing, Tim Self, and that 22 was out there quite often. But if I'm, we're just looking at the poor ices alone, 5,900 for AWS, 55 for Roper, 54 for Roboth. That's right. Three drivers under 6K in the lineup. That's how you made Kyle Busch work. That's why we're going over this right now. Let's look back at that 20 spring or 19 spring race. Well, hopefully, Norm Benning is not going to be on my screen. Kyle Busch, 31 hog points, dominator points, fast slap, slap, slap points. Not the biggest number in the world, but there is about a 30 point gap, 22 point gap between Bush and Friesen. No one else scores. And when they do, you pay for that score. They're not that efficient. Bush is at 5X. But if you just look at the top 10 in terms of fantasy points, no one is really blasting it out of the park other than the value that came through. We got 5, 9, 6, 6, 4, 4. You get the 8, 2 from Roper. 4, 5, 4, 9, 4, 5, 5, 6. When there really isn't a bunch of efficient scoring in the top 10, then obviously Bush's 5X is going to work. And yes, again, we get the, now he got Tyler Dipple. Crazy $7,900 price tag for young motorsports. 24th to 8th. That one really leaves you scratching your head. But average position of 13th, real surprise there. If you build a Tyler Dipple line, congratulations to you in 2019, the spring, the early days of DFS NASCAR trucks. I probably did a video on that a long time ago. You can probably find it on the channel. But what you all really want to know is Corey Roper. There it is. The Rope Mobile, $6,000. Average running position 17th, not bad. But again, that can be overstated when we get plenty of cautions in races. That can be overstated by the nature of Texas. I mean, my average running position is 19th. Cool, we ran 40 laps under yellow. <laughs> so I don't know if I want to overreact to that. And I think we all would agree, for the most part, the Roper Mobile was a value pick. And wasn't really a consistent top 20 driver. And then we got Jesse Awuji, as I live and breathe, 22nd average running position, along with Ray Cicerelli, 22nd average running position, 5,500 and 5,300 respectively. They get into the top 20 at the end. They finish a lap down, but they started 30th. They started 28th. You're just chasing. You got Jennifer Joe Cobb in the top 20 DFS wise. Holy Lord. Are you ready for this? I hope you are ready for this. You're going to get some Thad Mata in your life. Oh, Lord. let's talk about that in a second. I wasn't planning on actually looking at the punts, but we need to brace ourselves. So we got the two triple punts that you're preparing for this week. And again, it's worth stating because I know you're wanting to fight it. And I know you want to squirm and wiggle. And then you're going to hear people who, who just want to do contrarian content about how you can't play Kyle Bush. And I get that. And it is a fair argument. It's a fair discussion. It should be had. And maybe we can change our minds and we should be objective as possible and open to the possibility. But we don't want to just be contrarian to be contrarian. We don't want to be contrarian for clicks and say negative things for clicks and be mean to people for clicks, whatever. Huh. We got positive vibes here. So we're continuing to have this conversation. And we got the bush. We got the triple triple punt. And the thing that it makes it work is it's just that no one else scores. And I just I can't hit that enough. No one else scores any points, and that's why it always works. And that's not something that I just bring up this week. We know in the truck series, the best trucks start towards the front. They finish towards the front. They're expensive. And for the most part, you don't really get the most efficient plays. And when that's the case, and then on top of that, you throw in a Kyle Busch, and he comes in like a vacuum cleaner and vacuums out all the hog points, sucks them towards him. Then they have the opportunity to score even fewer points. They become even less efficient when they just simply score in their finishing position bucket alone. Now, here is a circumstance or situation that could change that. 
if for whatever reason we get multiple elite drivers starting in the back then you got to get your calculator out then the kyle bush lock triple punt may not mathematically be the best because the only way that kyle bush really doesn't work is if top tier drivers and we're gonna need a couple of them in this race we really only have like see we only, we didn't even get one you got Friesen who gets seven place differential nine fast laps finishes second at 9800 58.25 he's not enough to upset the apple court cart you needed another guy Crafton getting seven place differential didn't get it done and if we look at the fall or the 20 spring race where he was in it you got Crafton and freezing both the double digit place differential the price isn't that expensive both 6.3 now and you even had an alternative to Bush, Christian Eckes. So you look at this lineup, and I, I believe this is a very interesting example. Eckes, 8,300, 8X, Hog, great, finishes second. Marvelous. Matt Crafton, 9.5, but he scores almost 60 fantasy points based on a plus differential. Gets some fast out of that. It's a really good day. Friesen, very similar, up to 56 points, 14 place differential, finishes fourth, 8,900. You got these three, and yet the optimal lineup does not include them all. It still goes Bush and says, we don't need Friesen, or we don't need Crafton, we'll take Friesen, and we'll triple punt. And that's the question I'm asking is, the one thing that could deter us from playing Kyle Bush is we get drivers that we think can top five double digit place differential, but that's not enough because you can see here, you got the top five, you got the place differential and still Bush survives. Crafton starts 15th, Friesen starts 18th, and you even get the benefit of another hog that's affordable. Still doesn't work to knock Kyle Busch off the throne. You're going to need at least two really good drivers starting in the 20s. And they're going to have to get all the way and get that top five and secure that top five in a race that could be chaotic. The odds are against that. So the first chip you need to follow is a guy, two really good drivers to completely screw the pooch in qualifying. Then you need them to unscrew the pooch, get into the top five, and then you need them to survive at Texas. All these things must happen. And then, even then, you still need Kyle Busch to kind of not have a great day. Because if Kyle Busch has a great day, then their efforts all may be for naught. I don't like the chances of Kyle Busch not being in the optimal lineup. We understand the scenario that has to unfold. But this 2020 spring race really shows you how much really has to happen to get us off the Bush triple punt. You want to go zero bush it's a possibility we're not going to kill that dead right now it's a possibility it's open to discussion you'll have to go over that throughout the week that's why we're doing this homework you know the trolls and the haters jealous of all this content that gets put out early in the week jealous of all the work that you put in and your grind they just want pick videos on friday nights they don't want analysis. They just want to give out picks with analysis. This guy sucks. You just got to play Kyle Bush. Why do I got to play Kyle Bush? What are the situations where the Kyle Bush works? What's the true punt? Just do what I say. Obey. This is not an obey podcast. We're doing our homework now so that we know. We know there's going to be a short truck window on Friday. We're going to plan. Let them pick on the fly. That's why you want to be here. Hit that like button, subscribe, share, recruit more people. If you like NASCAR, talking NASCAR, then this is what you want to be a part of. You want picks? It's okay to just go somewhere else. If you just want picks and you want me to tell you who to play, you don't want to actually talk about racing, then it's okay. This is probably not for you. There's plenty of other YouTube videos out there and more better for you. I don't want to take up your time. I want to save you time. I want to save you money. I'm going to make it easy on you. I like to plan, 
and most of the people that are listening this far in the podcast, you like to plan too. You know that there's an edge when you plan. You know there's an edge when you don't pick on the fly. You know there's an edge when you don't just follow tout blindly. Like to learn, like to get better. I mean, this is a lot. The planning thing is, it's very simple. It is my background, right? You guys know that I teach. You have to plan. And I'm not just talking about lesson plans. Sure, there are lesson plans, but a part of those lesson plans are planning for when things go wrong, planning for when people aren't interested, planning for problems between people. How are you going to be able to solve those? If you can anticipate moments that could go astray or things that could go wrong or relationships that are not working out, you can put in preventative measures and you can prevent those things from happening. Same thing with your DFS. If you've got a plan going into Friday night and things change all of a sudden, or we see a qualifying situation that opens up the zero bush, you're gonna be prepared, they won't be. And in most cases, you're gonna build better lineups in that small window. If you plan ahead, think about the scenarios, when things change, you can change and adapt a lot quicker than someone who cannot, you will build better lineups and better lineups in the end will result in wins, W's. That's why you're here. That's why we're here, that's why we're together. That's why you have subscribed to the channel or maybe you have Venmo and PayPal and Cash App, and I really appreciate that. It's awesome. Love having you guys here. Let's keep going. And let's talk about who's running well in 2024. Oh, wait, actually, first of all, we wanted to explore the ugliness. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Here's what you're looking at if you're punting. I don't think you're going to get a punt price on Chris Wright. Keith McGee is going to be there. This is the secondary Josh Rayum car. Josh Rayum bought the points from the 22 AM racing. Used to be Austin Wayne self. It's bounced around throughout the years. They dialed things down. And this year, Rayum has a slight connection with Sawinski, but AM is not really working on these trucks. You can see based on the results, Keith McGee is dead last in terms of driver rating this year. They just have a ride secured every single week. Kind of missed the 22 being a decent truck. Thad Moffat. Brakes fail every single week. We never consider him. But guess what? You might have to this week. What are you doing, Martinsville? At least he had the 31st highest driver rating. Finished 27th. He has finished 25, 26, 27. Do you get him starting dead last? Despite them failing and qualifying in practice every single week, at least he goes out there and finishes in the top 30. And we cannot be that picky with our ugly punts. And especially if we're going to get one starting dead last. So, Thad Moffat, Richard Petty's grandson, welcome to our lives. Spencer Boyd, much easier to click his name when he's running for Young Motorsports. At least though, he does have a top 30 in every race of the season. Can't be picky. I wouldn't eliminate him. Mason Massey, disappointing season so far. We expect a lot more. We like young trucks, but they are just simply not producing. Uh, I, it's an easier time to click on his name. Obviously he finished 11th in Texas last year. Finished 11th in Martinsville last week. Much better than where he ran, but that was Martinsville. He's getting top 30s. Um, the equipment's probably a little more secure than Moffitt and Boyd, but I don't know if that really matters too much. Maybe you put a little bit into it. We're just wanting guys to turn laps and not wreck. Matt Mills, maybe his salary will have dropped at that point, but the reality is if we're talking about a race where everyone wrecks and has issues, Matt Mills is the king of wrecking and having issues this season. The trucks are fast. Nice looks pretty good. Nice is the top of the backpack. And you can make a sound argument that Bailey Curry is above the backpack. He's actually with the top tier at the very bottom. Nice isn't great. This isn't Ross Chastain Nice days, but this is not the Nice darkness days either. Mills just can't buy a break. Hood flipped up last week at the end of the race. Wallace Allen. Look, I would take a bad Rayum truck in this race. And this is a little bit better of a Rayum truck. Not the greatest ever. Wallace Allen's not the greatest ever race car driver. But 
again, I'll just say it. You know, we had Jennifer Joe Cobb in that 2019 race scoring a top 20 DFS score. Uh, you can't count out Lyle Salen in a race that's full of cautions. Tydell's not cheap enough. He should be marked as a punt play. Because, look, we look at driver rating. To start the season, his average driver rating is 24th, and that ranks 26th in this field. That's where they are. They're a 25th place race truck. And they should be in that punt value price. They won't be. They should be. Timmy Hill's been better. I'll take Timmy Hill for sec- for sure. Uh, I don't think Connor Jones is going to be affordable. It is a Thor truck. Uh, if he is priced accordingly, then yeah, I definitely would consider it. Although he hasn't been that great. And the Thor ride that they've been tossing around to different drivers hasn't been that good. But then again, when you're tossing around a bunch of different drivers and all of them are of limited experience what much can you really expect it's not like it's an all-star ride it's more of a thanks for working the shop type ride up and coming driver type ride so you can't really have huge expectations for it if you get a decent price on connor jones then definitely want to consider this young and up and coming driver brett holmes has been fine maybe hype brett holmes up a little bit with mike shiplett and their association with Spire, overall not terrible. Hasn't been running well lately. But if we do have one race that, man, look, I don't want to put too much into Las Vegas. And I also don't want to worry too much about Bristol Co. to Martinsville. At least he did finish 24th at Martinsville. It has been a real funky schedule just overall. And even in the last three weeks, very difficult to really take any of the speed from the last couple of weeks of results and pour those over. That's probably all you're going to get punt wise. Not a lot of them. Not a lot of ways to differentiate right there, actually. You're going to be looking at Keith McGee, unfortunately, which I hate. But you're just going to want to expand your pool. Moffat's fine. It's ugly and it's not cool, but you just have to accept what you are doing. I'm not punting with Thad Moffat in a normal week. You may have felt that itch or urge over the last couple weeks but you probably didn't pull the trigger or maybe you did, but it didn't work. You may have felt the itch with Boyd, but then you remind yourself, this is not the same truck that he used to have. And you just ignored the fact that Jeff Hammond was his crew chief. Or you just told yourself, it ain't 1990 anymore. We don't need Jeff Hammond. Like the cars have cars changed a little bit. Trucks changed a little bit there, Jeff. Uh, you know, it's easier to click on Massey. It's easier to click on Mills. It'll be easier to click on Allen. So that's where a lot of people are going to go. And it's going to carry a lot of ownership. And if we are picking a triple punt and we've got six guys to pull from and two of them are really bad, you're going to have to go with those two really bads to differentiate how you get your triple punt working. Just the way that it's going to go. All right. There's your punt talk. You only get this. I race for the prize.com PayPal Venmo Cash App. There's a link below. Do it. One of us. One of us. You want to be a part of this. I love doing this, man. I, I, I really do love doing this. I have a blast. It's a great way to kick off a morning. All right, let's look at who's running well this year. And I've got them broken down here into categories. Obviously, Kyle Bush is your guy. We look at the Dietrich data, which breaks down laps and creates an equation of 0 to 1. 0.97 in Atlanta. We don't really care about that. 0.84 Las Vegas would have been higher, had uh, issues on pit road. Comes back, 0.97 at Bristol. Jamin Bush. He's going to be lights out. Spire was fast at Las Vegas. Spire's been fast at Texas over the years. Jamin. All right, so then we look at our championship contenders. Majeski's on the top of the board. Taylor Gray, Ankum. Sanchez, Heim, not really much separates them. Most of them don't really have poor races. Um, you could look at Daytona maybe bringing down a couple in Majeski and Heim and inflating others with good results. We're not separating Daytona from this data in this case. Either way, I don't think anyone disagrees. Those are the best drivers. If anyone is going to challenge Kyle Busch for laps led, at Texas, it's going to be Majeski, Gray, Ingram, Sanchez, or Hunt. Maybe you can build with both of them. We'll have to see how the pricing works out. If we cannot, that's okay. 
and I would more than likely chase those guys if I can get place differential. I think that's unlikely you can get place differential. But other way, what we're really just doing is going over who are the elite drivers right now in the truck series. Those are them. Eckes is also in that equation, although he only ranks as a .72, but that is hurt by that Atlanta race. Otherwise, perfect race at Bristol, perfect race at Martinsville. Eckes is right there as well. Those are your killers. Those are your lap leaders. May not necessarily be hogs or dominators this week because of the Kyle Busch effect. But moving forward, that is who appears to be elite in our regular category. Then rounding at the top 10, I would argue it's Raja Karuth, or I don't even have to argue this is what the data says, right? This is not my point of view. This is when you go through all the laps from this season. It's Karuth, it's Crafton, Tenfinger, it's, it's Ben Rhodes. Ben Rhodes, despite a slow start, has regrouped over the last couple of weeks and has come back into the conversation as he always does. I don't think anyone has any disagreement over that. Um, it's about what we expect. If anything was a surprise, it was could Caruth adjust as quickly as he did? Obviously, that was answered at Las Vegas. Spire looks good. Crafton is adjusting finally to the new crew chief and the new changes. And he's out there just looking like normal Crafton in finger. Slight concerns of, all right, well, the CRS7, Roba, McAnally team have a strong alliance. The answer was pretty quickly yes, and they have been fine. And Vin Rhodes just doing Vin Rhodes. Now, we move outside the top 10, and we've got Chase Purdy running really well for Spire, finally putting it together, also benefiting from some strong Spire trucks. Really good race last week. Not as dependable, but... Hard to argue against him in the top 15. Tanner Gray lives in the top 15. That's where he's been his whole career. And that's why this Tricon truck will probably stay. And Friesen, maybe make an argument for top 10. He's working his way there. He has improved over the last couple weeks. So I would listen to the argument that Friesen's more of a top 10 driver. But the data right now still suggests because of a bad Daytona in Atlanta, he's top 15. You take those out. And the average for the last four races is a... 0.68, which would put him up above Grand Infinger. So based on the last four races, Friesen is a top 10 driver. He's being weighed down by Daytona and Atlanta, which we shouldn't worry too much. All right, now let's move out of the top 15. Who are the drivers rounding out the back of the top? The top tier bottom? The top two year bottom? Dean Thompson, really not terrible. Kind of up and down. But at the end of the day, we have to respect the Tricon, the David Gilliland truck, and that keeps him in that 15 to 20 range. Will he let you down at times? Yes. Does he have much upside? I would argue no. And that really makes him a tough play in DFS. Daniel Dye, same conversation. Well, I would argue a lot differently. I think Daniel Dye has a lot more upside and potential eventual in his career, maybe not necessarily as a DFS NASCAR play, he is in a Bill McAnally truck, which is pretty solid. His numbers are going to be inflated here because of these two races. But he is right around a 20th place driver at times. And as we mentioned before, that Las Vegas race, maybe possibly could have sniffed the top 10. You like the truck. He is still young. Had arc of success. We're not arguing that he's a top 15 driver. We're arguing that he's a top 20 driver. And that's pretty simple to do when we look at the people above him, when we look at the people behind him. Scraping any higher than 15th is going to be a challenge for Daniel Dye. He could get up to 12th at times. I don't know if Dean Thompson is always going to do that. We've seen enough out of Dean Thompson. Now, the argument could be made we got a lot of Dean Thompson's Nice days, and those were during the Nice dark days, that maybe there is something there with Dean Thompson, some meat left on the bone, and I'm inflating Daniel Dye too much. But as we have this conversation, we realize eh, there probably isn't too much of a difference. And they both did, should be in that. They both deserve to be in a top 20. And maybe we should put a little bit more respect on them and consider what could possible happen as they work with two really good teams. Jake Garcia also in there. I expect a little bit more from Garcia. But the final Thor truck just doesn't seem to have too much going on. Adjusting to a new team. These are about the results Garcia was putting together last year with McAnally. Maybe he will slowly evolve and get it. There is room for potential and growth, but at the moment, he's right there with Diane Thompson. 
in terms of our regulars. And then you could argue that Bailey Curry, kind of the oddball, is he a backpack driver? Is he in that bat bottom field with Nice? Or is he in the top? I would argue that he is a top 20 driver. He is in the top tier, although I wouldn't put Nice in the top tier. I put Nice as a backpack team, top of the backpack. But he is the outlier who tends to get good performances, who is a very good race truck driver. And he may be better than Thompson, Dye, or Garcia in terms of driving ability. But it is difficult for his Nice truck to always compete with a Tricon or a McAnally or a Thor truck. But even then, truck sometimes doesn't even matter in this package where the trucks are all pretty similar. And then you throw in a bazillion cautions and it just becomes the better driver who carries the day. And so in that circumstance, which I think weighs much more heavily, I would go Bailey Curry. Then as we look at the backpack, Lane Riggs is thoroughly disappointing. Again, he is a young kid, but we expect a lot more from a front row truck. He needs to be better than top 20. He just does. Just this morning, we'll see what happens with Riggs eventually. And that pretty much wraps it up for who's been hot. We'll quickly close this podcast with our hog trends at Texas. And you can see on average 35 from the leader, 15, 10. You've had as many as 60 and 44 in previous ones. And typically, these hog slash dominator points are coming from the front, 60 from the pole, 28 from the pole, 44 from the pole. You have 25 is 40. You know, basically, people are starting within striking distance and getting up there. We do have one outlier. If we go down, we'll find this 20. This was Chase Elliott in 2021, very affordably priced. So there is that. It's again, Spire Hendrick type truck. That's your hog trends. If we were to look back at previous optimals, the reason why I'm only going to do this for a second is because if you're looking at optimals that didn't include a $1,600 cotton bush, then it's probably not going to be very helpful because the whole build, the whole construction is going to be completely different. I mean, you can get an idea of how some of the value plays work, like Jordan Anderson, who had an average running position 30th at Texas last year, finishes 14th. You know, you look at Brett Holmes, he isn't in the optimal lineup, but he scores a bunch of fantasy points, finishing a lot better. So you can look at previous optimals, get an idea of how some of these value plays may not necessarily be good drivers that good good finishes that's all going to kind of connect with how many cautions are in a specific race but outside of looking at the specific races where you have 1600 dollars Kyle bush it's really not that helpful to break down some of the optimal lineups it's there at raceforthepriz.com you can find it if you want to pour through previous optimal lineups everything is there to do your homework to get ready and i really think you gotta join me join us like i love doing it. i love helping you out when I help you and you PayPal, Venmo, Cash App me, you help my family and help with the, the three Ds, diapers, daycare, and Mickey Ds. And we're not doing diapers anymore, but we still have to get babysitters. We still got to get the Mickey Ds. So you hadn't signed up, discount before Friday, 20 bucks. 20 bucks gets you the rest of the month. You're not going to make you do the 30 bucks. I understand Martinsville is out the window. So 20, if you can't understand, thanks though for joining us and being here. Keep liking these videos. Share it. Recruit people over here. Tell them about this channel. Tell them about the work that we're doing. It's disruptive, but it's positive. I mean, no one's making it easier for you. No one saves you more time. We're building something, something special. Your big box DFS is dying. Those guys are dinosaurs. This is a new phase. I don't know if you recognize that. But like these Walmart websites that cover every DFS sport, jack of all trades, master of none, they're done. Those things are going away and they're trying to appeal to loyalty and they be part of our team and they've got logos and they got branding. At the end of the day, like, wait, how do you know how to do all these different sports at once? Where do you have the time? How are you an expert in everything? And people are waking up to that and they're finding their specific content guy and saying, no, this guy knows baseball. He only does baseball. I'm following this guy. And we've seen a lot of these guys go solo and part ways from the Walmart websites and people follow them to the different place. Like, I don't want to spend $300, $200 on 17 sports. This is a sport I like. This guy's the expert. And we're getting creator directed community, single sport focus. You know, some creators, they want that. Look, and I get it. In 2018, I wanted that sign up site safety blanket that guaranteed money at Fanvice. I took it. I took it at Roto Grinders. I wanted that blankie. I wanted that protection. I wanted that security. I wanted to be able to hide behind the rest of the guys. And when my picks weren't working, I just pointed out, well, the NBA guy's getting stuff right. 
or oh well the mass entry guy's getting stuff right and it's nice and it's easy but these days there's no more blankies and i've I mean, i've been sold since 2019 i separated from them and said you know what i'm just going to take it direct to the people if i win i win if i fail i fail if people hate me they hate me but i'm not going to hide behind others i'm not going to hide behind a website uh, i'm going to make this work on my own i'm going to grind it out and now you're seeing a lot of other guys do it some by choice some have been you know, forced out of websites or left websites. And like, they've just decided, look, I know what I'm doing. I know what to create. Let's go for it. It's tough. It's been a long haul, but it's starting to happen now. And you're seeing it. It's much more solo, independent out there. And you don't need to pay for 70 million sites. And like another thing that one of the things that was always hurtful, and you can see this, this is just common across the industry. I wanted to do more content during FanVice days, but FanVice can't have their podcast feed flooded with NASCAR content. They're doing other things. They need people to be able to access baseball, basketball, golf. That was the situation in 2018. They couldn't have like people scrolling through 70 NASCAR videos. So I was only allowed to do one. And that's the way that it works in the industry of if you work for a site, you do your one specific podcast, your other content you cannot do because it'll flood the YouTube stream. It'll flood our Twitter feed and it hurts our other videos. Not that the content's not good, not that the content won't help you because if you do a bunch of NASCAR stuff or if I did a bunch of NASCAR, I would have been boosted huge. But they had to limit the content to help the other content, to make the other content more accessible. And that always slightly bothered me. I wanted to do as much content as possible. And then you can't really go out and do content for other sites because you're working for that site. So that's why me being solo and independent, I can do a million videos. It doesn't hurt anything. And other websites, you get one video a week, two maybe on the weekend because they can't. It's just it, it's because of the, you know, the big box DFS websites. That's the way they work. And that's OK. That's fine. But I always that always bothered me. And I always wanted to get more content to the people. And so that's why I am able to do a bunch of content. There's no other reason to it, right? The algorithm loves it. The likes, the shares, everything works. The more content you make, the better. The better content you make, the better. The more content that you're making over and over, the better that you get. If I was only doing one video a week, I wouldn't improve very much. If I was doing one video a week in the same format every single week, I wouldn't improve any much. And, and the, you know, wouldn't grow. And you see it, it stagnates static and that's kind of what happened to fan bias my, my podcast grew and then it stagnated because you just weren't doing it enough you weren't reaching out enough you weren't spreading your content out enough i was limited i was throttled and you see that with other stuff so that's not here and i'm glad that you are here keep liking subscribing sharing recruiting and hopefully you start winning some and everything works out for you very blessed to have you guys here. I love you guys. Trip the light fantastic.